Okay, I am recording now. So if anyone feels uncomfortable, if you want to mute your video, you're welcome to do so. Um, as I was saying, so my name is Kristen Boggs. I'm the director of the Albert Schweitzer Fellowship here in Alabama. Um, and tonight is just a chance for us to kind of think about how maybe the Schweitzer Fellowship can be a positive experience for you. Um, and then, you know, most importantly, sort of how you can leverage experiences that you've had to, in order to make a difference out in the community. And we're joined by two of our former fellows tonight, Newton Tinsley and A.T. Felix. And so they'll be sharing about their experiences too. So um, you see our mission stated here. Essentially though, we are trying to train graduate students, many of whom are in health related fields, but they don't have to be. But we wanna train them to be able to identify um, health disparities and then to address those, as well as to address social determinants of health, those things about where we live, work, and play that have an impact down the line on our health outcomes. And so really, as you read this, you'll probably notice that really our focus is on you as this future professional. So we want to give you the skills and knowledge and really just encouragement and, uh, you know, kind of fire and commitment to wanting to work with vulnerable populations after you graduate. Um, so we do that through kind of a two or three prong approach. The two main pieces are that there is this direct service project that you do either independently or with a partner. Um, it's 200 hours over the course of a year, which is a big undertaking, but I think maybe one of the things um, AT and Newton can talk to you about today is you know, how that can be feasible on top of what you already have going on with school or work and elsewhere. Um, you're doing it collaboratively with a community agency and you're learning a lot of skills about how to plan and implement and evaluate a community-based project. So that's really, I think, the main thing that people think about when they are, you know, thinking about the Schweitzer Fellowship experience. But I do want to point out that we also offer these educational workshops that are meant to give you a greater, you know, kind of skill and um, knowledge base in order to do this work well. So we don't want to be out in the community kind of haphazardly doing it. Um, and so our workshops are usually held once a month and they're an opportunity to learn from leaders in, you know, health services as well as academia on topics like um, not only project planning and implementation, but also um, cultural humility, like how do we do this work in a way that's respectful of the communities that we're going to be a part of? Um, how do we recognize and appreciate the social determinants of health? Um, recognizing and, and acting in kind of interprofessional teams and also self-care. This is tough work and we know that if you are gonna commit to this in the long run, you need to be able to take care of yourself as well. So these are some fun pictures about um, fellowship projects that have happened over the years. Um, you'll notice that some of them take place in schools with you know, maybe K through 12 students mentoring and educating them. Um, some of them are focused on health and well-being. You see a picture of yoga, but we've had cooking demonstrations and um, all kinds of classes like that. A lot of it is health education. So we have um, some pictures there that are about um, like a senior companionship program that went and visited homebound seniors in order to address some of their social isolation, which again, COVID really, I think makes that hit home even more now than before. And then a lot of our projects deal with um, uh, chronic diseases. So maybe diabetes or um, as well as um, infectious diseases like HIV AIDS. But all to say that the options are pretty endless and um, part of my role is to help you figure out what you're passionate about and what the needs are in the community and sort of find that meeting point. So I wanna turn it over shortly to um, AT and Newton to tell you more, but I do wanna say that if you're intrigued to hear more examples, we have all of our fellows highlighted on the website um, I'll try to drop our website into the chat box as well, but essentially asfalabama.org, it's going to be a great place for you to go to read more about our fellows and also our application. 
So um, last thing I'll say is just some of the benefits that you may receive. Um, the stipend is listed there, but I definitely don't think that that is the motivator for anyone to do this. I think it really is that top um, bullet point there that, you know, we attract people, we want people to be a part of this program who are seeking an opportunity to learn from the community as much as to give back to the community. Um, and so this is a great opportunity to not only learn from your site mentors and your academic mentors, but from your peers. So one thing we hear is that oftentimes, um, you know, it's just difficult for schools to get together people who represent nursing and public health and law and social work and counseling and, you know, a multitude of other fields. And I think that's one of the unique things about ASF. And the other unique thing is we are one of 13 chapters around the country. So um, there's more efforts underway now than ever before to really build out what that alumni network can mean and do for our fellows for life. Um, these pictures that you see here, I, I, I like it just because um, it also is an example to me of fellows who benefited by, I think, gaining clarity about their future paths. So Catherine Jones here on the left ended up going into rehabilitation sciences because she realized after doing a project with art and seniors that she was really interested in sort of this intersection between um, their mental well-being and kind of the physical and dexterity and other things that are involved in art. Um, and then on the right are two images from Rachel Stokes. She'll be sharing on um, Sunday afternoon, but essentially she was in environmental health sciences and is still in environmental health sciences working with Indian Health Service. So I think um, an, an added benefit is that it can just kind of clarify career goals. All right, so with that, I wanna turn it over to AT and Newton. Um, I've just invited them to share briefly about their projects. And I invited them specifically because I think they each had a unique way that they sort of brought in their personal experiences to inform you know, the project that they chose to do and the partner that they chose to do it with. Um, I've also told them that any advice they want to give to applicants, this is also a great opportunity. Um, so let me open it up. AT, you are our 2016 fellow, so maybe we'll let you go first. I'm, I'm one of the OGs. I'm <laughs> original. Uh, so hi, everybody. My name is AT. Um, as Kristen was saying, I was part of the, um, like, what is it, an introduction inaugural. inaugural group um of fellows so my experience i may say some things and kristen please let me um, you know if i say stuff that has changed um or like expectations or things um but just some background information about me so currently i am a high school science teacher over in um, atlanta georgia um and when i was in the fellowship program, I was getting my master's in public health um, with a specialization in health behavior. Um, and so my story kind of starts um, actually in undergrad. I've always been very passionate about mental health awareness um, and kind of advocating and educating people on mental illnesses, the signs and symptoms, um, and then providing a like, supportive space for people to share. And so um, I was always a volunteer. I worked at the crisis center. Um, I did a lot of crisis counseling. Um, I was involved as an RA. So I did a lot of crisis response. Um, and so as I was um, finishing up my undergrad experience, um, I had a friend very close to me who also did crisis work with me. We were both very educated in like how to respond to these kinds of situations, how to talk to people that were going through a lot of information. Um, but it was the first time I felt like I was talking to somebody who was like truly living a very dark place for them. Um, and so it was my senior year, I got a text and he was like, hey, can I talk to you? Um, and so he came up and joined me in my room and shared that he was experiencing suicidal thoughts and that he'd been planning um, how everything and just wanted to share with me. But both of us just kind of sat there and looked at each other like, okay, well, if you were calling into the crisis center, this is what I would say, but it, I don't quite know what to do. Um, and so we both were like, well, if you were calling in, we would say to go to the hospital. So we went to the hospital 
And I remember us sitting in there and I draw connections to my experience with him and my experience with my other friend who is just a very clumsy person. And he like jumped over a bush one time and like his ankle swelled up. And so I had to take him to the hospital. And so when you think about these two connections of those experiences, my friend who ankle was like four times the size was getting like medical advice from the people in the waiting room you know everybody was telling him about like oh well if you've done this um we got to go to the triage just like normal um but when i went with my friend for mental health concerns we had to go to a separate area of the emergency room um, which was obviously for privacy um but right away we were met with sort of here are the two different paths you follow, um, dependent on if you have physical pain or mental pain. Um, and then from there, it just became more stark, the differences. It's like my friend, he only had to tell when he, when he swole, when his ankle was swollen, he only had to tell about two people at the hospital the story. And then it just kind of became a like brag thing for him. Um, whereas my friend who was having mental health concerns had to tell probably six to seven um, medical professionals just as he moved up the line in the emergency room um, of sort of that process of how it works. Um, my friend with the ankle was given very clear instructions of how things were going to work and where we should be. Um, my friend who was having mental health concerns was asked to give up all of his items makes sense that he's a threat to himself they want to keep him safe um, but if i needed to go to the bathroom i had to make sure a nurse was there to sit and watch him um, so there was just very like stark differences um, my friend is great um, he credits that hospital visit to helping him kind of see a way to get more support um, and a better diagnosis so it was beneficial for us to go to the hospital However, the experience for him and the experience for me as a friend kind of wanting to be there and care for him um, made it very difficult for me to then return to the crisis center and like recommend that people go to the hospital um, just because it was such a potentially traumatizing event of just sort of how that process works. Um, and so when the fellowship program um, came about. Uh, I saw this as an opportunity to kind of explore ways to assist bridging that gap. Um, and so I talked with Kristen a lot in that process of sort of figuring out like, what would this look like as a project? How could I apply with this idea? Um, where does this process look to like accomplish something in a year? That was also like a really big weird thing for me. I was like, people have been trying to do this forever. Like people know this is a problem. How am I going to just come in and do it in a year? Um, and so what I think it helped in general for my project, what I ended up doing was um, creating a handbook or a guide that would be given to individuals who are visiting the emergency room for the first time for mental health concerns. Um, and the handbook kind of walked them through like, these are the things you should bring with you to the emergency room. Here's the people you may talk to. Um, it also helped to tell them like, you don't have to share your full story to the triage nurse, but you do need to tell your full story to the psychiatric nurse, like kind of differentiating what those roles are. Um, and so in the end, my project ended up being picked up by uh, UAB's counseling center and they use it now with students um, to kind of preemptively help them. So how do you pack a bag? You know, make sure you bring your phone charger, you'll be there for a while, you know, that kind of information. Um, but I think in general, the benefits of the program were allowing for the medical community who can sometimes become very like, like, check, 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 let me check the boxes to get a diagnosis, um, to have a conversation about like, we do truly care about our patients that's not a question but like how do we make sure that we're communicating that in a moment where we have a lot of people to take care of so it was sort of that conversation with the psychiatry department bridged with the mental health advocates that were like let's all kumbaya and having to be like no there are some strict guidelines they need to follow like we can't just let everybody kumbaya um, and so that was sort of my experience of taking a personal thing um, and bringing it into the project and then I don't know how my time is, but I wanted to do like two pieces of advice. Is that good? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So one thing that um, I wanted to say based off what Kristen was talking about when she brought up the 200 hours. Um, so just for full transparency, um, I was in my master's program and I also worked full time um, in UAB housing at the time for the fellowship. And so I think the benefit of doing a project that's personal, um, as opposed to sort of a project that maybe you think is needed, but maybe not close to you, um, is that you can usually draw some connections to your outside, like to your school or to your job. And so for much of my experience in the fellowship, 
while the 200 hours may seem like a lot on paper, I was able to use a lot of those to help with like assignments in class or to bridge the gap between like talking to people at my job to get some more experience for that project. So I think if you find something that's personal, it lets those hours like be multiple areas of benefit instead of just for your project. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention was when thinking about a site partner um, to partner with, to think about like what you hope to have in that partnership before approaching a site partner. Um, I think for me, I just looked for what made sense. And so I went with the crisis center for my site partner. Um, but looking back on my project, I wish I would have thought a little bit more about like what do I hope to gain from this site partnership um, to allow me to better kind of align that role? Because they ended up not really being able to help me that much because they didn't have access to the hospital and they didn't have access to like the local counseling centers. They were just sort of a place that supported people. Um, so thinking about like what I want to like get out of that partnership um, would be a better route for me at my project at least. Thank you, A.T. Yeah, we'll let Newton pick up from there. All right, hey everybody. Um, my name is Newton Tinsley. I'm a, a nurse anesthetist here in Northport, Alabama, right next to Tuscaloosa, title town. Um, but uh, my project was done in 2017, 2018, and um, it was at a place called Unless You. Um, and for those of you that are from Sanford, you may have heard about them, um, but they're a local school in the Homewood, Birmingham area that helps um, with a certain um, age range of uh, students, uh, mostly post high school to adult um, age. Um, and they all have different types of developmental um, disabilities. Um, and so this school is a place that um, they can go to and find um, different skills to learn. They can um, learn, just broaden their knowledge base um, and, and grow as, you know, individuals. Um, and they require very specific teaching because of their certain abilities. And so Unless You is great at uh, catering to those uh, needs. And so um, I learned about Unless You through uh, Lunch and Learn that Sanford provides. Um, and then also I learned about ASF in particular through one of those Lunch and Learns as well. And so it was just neat how um, you take something that you go to not necessarily um, expecting to have this few month relationship out of, um, but I went to a Lunch and Learn and then now I'm a fellow for life. And so uh, it's interesting how you have these um, little moments in life that can end up changing um, your future. But um, at the Lunch and Learn, I met a, was it a 2016, 2017 fellow, um, a, a duo? And um, they were pharmacy students, so not even in the particular field that I was in. But I was so fascinated with how um, this organization, ASF, uh, helped them reach their goals and gave them different tools to, to, um, to help them. And so um, at the Lunch and Learn, I uh, met Kristen and we, um, you know, I also at school at Sanford met a really good friend, um, William Gafford. And it just turned out that um, through the service learning that we had to do, um, at our program, we were able to connect with Unless You and, um, uh, you know, go from there. But anyways, um, one particular thing I wanted to talk about was um, how we developed our project. And so that was uh, having a particular relationship and a, a personal relationship with the founder of Unless You, Lynn, Lindy Cleveland. And, um, what we did is we found that these students needing needed some better teaching on just simple things like hand washing, uh, different nutritional guidelines that would be um, catered towards them and um, helping them make easier selections and better foods. Um, and so we worked with Lindy and because um, the way our program was set up, we had every Friday off from either our clinical site or from um, didactic learning. And so 
William and I, we were able to um, dedicate at least a couple hours every Friday morning um, to Unless You. Um, and that was really good and helpful at helping us meet those two, uh, 200 hours. Um, I find that if you can do a few hours spread out over a period of time, it makes it so much easier and doable. And so um, for those of you, I know we said we had a few from Samford. If y'all still have those Fridays off, that would be a, a great time for you to um, find an organization that you connect with and that uh, you could help and serve at. But um, Kristen, anything in particular that you can help? Um, do you have a question or does anyone in the audience have a question to help guide me? Um, I love question and answer more than me just rambling. So. Yeah, and Newton, I'll just say, I recall too that one of the early experiences you and William had at Unless You, like before you were a fellow, was that you were at one of their basketball games and a student um, had, was it a? Yes, yes, had a, a seizure. So this was um, a student that had epilepsy um, and the, the staff there, you know, they're wonderful, they're great, but they don't necessarily come from a medical background like William and I did. And so we were there, we, they, they knew who we were, so they called upon us to help and it was through that experience as well as others that they and us realized that they could use some, you know, education on th different things. And so, yeah, that that one experience was kind of a, a kickstarter to helping us figure out different things we could help them with. And so, again, it just has to do with having that personal relationship with your site. And so if you can find an organization that you're really connected to, like an Unless You, that would make... Um, your project just even more spectacular, I think, so. Well, I definitely want to open it up for questions. I know some of the questions may be about some of the nitty gritty, so let me quickly mention that um, essentially anyone is eligible for the 2021 fellowship who would still be in school through the length of the fellowship, so meaning um, you would start in March 2021 and finish in April 2022, so you just need to know that you would be enrolled in school throughout that time. Um, and we do have an orientation on May the 1st that you would need to attend. Um, our application deadline is February 1st and the application is online. It basically allows you to tell us about your interesting goals. Um, one thing I will mention is that's different this year than when Newton and AT applied is that we realized it's a lot of work to you know, find a partner and kind of formulate a fully formed project idea. So um, this current year and then with your applicant class, we've actually allowed people to apply without having either of those things. And so we're really asking more general questions on the application about your interest and the types of ideas you have. And then we will mentor you in that first month or two of the fellowship to kind of hone in on a specific topic and a partner. So I think, you know, again, just want to inspire you that this is a very manageable process, um, but that, you know, thinking about the connections you already have in those relationships is a great place to start. And then- If um, I could just add something too, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Kristen, but uh, when we went to the um, the meetings and the groups, it, it was so uh, interesting to find uh, different people there that you may want to work with. If there were organizations and different ASF fellows that, um, you know, have become good friends that we stay in contact with. And so if you don't necessarily have a, a partner initially, I wonder if through those meetings, if they get connected, you know, that that, that could maybe form a partnership if they were looking at that. Absolutely. So that was really our intention this year. We sort of thought that would naturally happen. Um, and it didn't. So we have 16 fellows this year and they're all doing individual projects. But I am a fan of partner projects. And I think if anyone is interested in it, um, we didn't want that to be a deterrent this year. So um, we have allowed people again this year to apply as a partner, um, again, without kind of a specific partner, community partner pre-identified. 
And like Newton is suggesting, we would certainly be open to if you apply as an individual and then you find another individual who has a similar, you know, interest area that y'all could work together moving forward. So either of those approaches would certainly work. Um, so last thing before I open it up for questions, I just want to say that since I don't have like a, you know, a sheet to pass around and get your contact information, um, I'm going to rely on you following up with me. There's, this is going to take you through a Google form that'll just ask you for like your name and email. Um, if you're, you know, at all interested, I'd love to stay in touch and that's my best way to do so. Um, I just dropped that link in the chat as well. But with that, let's open up the floor for questions. I know someone has a question. I guess um, my question is how many people um, usually apply? I, I'm really interested in doing this and I think it'd be a great opportunity, but I don't have, um, I would have to do some brainstorming, but I don't have like a project or a partner on the top of my head or that I can think of. Um, is it something know, that we're um, mentored into or do we have to come in knowing what we wanna do? And Kristen, I may just speak specifically a little bit about Sanford since Kendall, I know that's where you are. Um, mm -hmm. Amy Snow, um, Dr. Snow, she is was our mentor at Sanford. And so she, she walked with us every step of the way. Um, okay. and she's wonderful. Um, you know, her main thing, or, or at least while I was there, was the service learning aspect of our um, degree. And so um, this is something she fully supports and backed us the entire way. She made it as easy as possible um, from Sanford's side of it. So, um, you know, I would not worry about that at all. And I would use her or if there was another faculty member there that you connected with, um, I would go to them and, and ask, hey, do you mind mentoring me through this process? Because um, mm -hmm. you do need to have one mentor at your university or or site to help you through. Um, Kristen, what else do you think? Um, so I think you had a couple of questions. One was about how many apply. We've had anywhere from 19 to 54. So every year is a little different. This upcoming year, we think we'll take around 14 fellows. Um, but I don't want that to be discouraging at all. Because again, I think, um, you know, we're looking for people who are curious, who are genuine, who are humble. Um, so we're, we're looking for people who don't necessarily have a ton of community-based experience. Um, so yeah, uh, I would just say work with me. I'd be happy to talk to you and sort of help you ask some of those questions like, what is it that I care about? What brought me into you know, nurse anesthesia? How can I tap into one of those areas of passion um, one of the things we've learned and the reason that we sort of took that out of the application is that a lot of graduate students are new to their communities and so they don't know who the, you know, organizations are. Um, and that's another role that I can help with as well. So I guess a two-part answer, one being, um, I think as long as you know a little bit about yourself, you are in perfect um, preparation to apply. And then my role is to kind of come alongside you as well as people like Newton was mentioning, you know, faculty at your school to kind of guide you the rest of the way and figure out how do we hone in on a specific topic and a specific organization. Um, and then we are going to do, just because of COVID, things are kind of changing in the nonprofit landscape right now and um, organizations that may have done something really consistently are having to rethink. So I'm trying not to take that for granted. And um, I'm doing some interviews right now with different nonprofit partners. And then we're gonna release a video kind of com compiling what they've said so that applicants can hear from them firsthand and just know like, okay, these seem to be the most pressing things for individuals right now. Um, so we're trying to keep our ear to the ground and just find out how is COVID impacting that. Just a quick add, because I was thinking about it, Kendall, when you were talking um, about like not having a project right off the top of your head. Um, I don't know if Kristen remembers, 
but my initial project was like a completely different project. So when I originally applied, um, the thought was, so if you've been hospitalized for a suicide attempt, you are more likely to attempt again. And so I had used that data to create a project that, um, would have like a class for like support members to participate in. I was going to partner with the psychiatry department. I mean, it was like the most elaborate plan. I had like all these people partnering. Um, and then I think like maybe two months in, I was like, Kristen, this is not going to work. Um, so I think it's like what Kristen was saying. It's just finding what your passion is because it's very easy once you found a passion to see a lot of avenues for you to reach that goal. Um, so your project avenue could change even based off if you had to have one on the application. Um, just recognizing like your end goal allows you to see that there's like multiple ways to get there. And that's what um, Kristen is so good at and ASF just as an organization, I think is so good at. It's just helping you um, formulate your ideas, um, formulating action plans. Don't you think AT, like they were very helpful. Um, and I agree, like our project changed quite a bit as well, just based off of uh, Kristen's advice and, and different mentors within the organization. So um, yeah, they're, they really support you and they want you to make the biggest impact possible. So it's great. Well, thank you, that, that did help. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I will just say as a funny, one of the benefits is that you get to have a nice hat <laughs> like this. Do you see the quality of that? <laughs> I still have it, have Kristen. <laughs> it was from one of our uh, service days. <laughs> yeah. I have a large head, so it doesn't quite fit, but it, I still wear it every once in a while. <laughs> For those who can't tell, it's a very nice like polyester or, or some material. It is not it is not a natural material from the yeah. earth. <laughs> like a recycled plastic, but hey, it, it looks nice. Um, well, I will take this opportunity just to plug our social media. So again, with, um, with us having to do things a little more virtual these days, we're certainly relying on social media to share word of different things um, and we'll continue to, you know, share like I was um, describing, you know, ideas that we hear from our community partners, reminders about application deadlines, um, you know, announcements about future sessions. I'm also going to hold like, I guess, office hours, just being online and accessible for people to jump on, ask me a question, me kind of give them advice. I try to tell people I'm not the one making the selection. So we have an advisory council made up of people from um, universities throughout our partnership. And they're the ones who ultimately pick. So my job is just to make you be the strongest candidate that you can be in order to like, you know, be impressive and, and, um, and wow that group. So please let me know what I can do. I realize my email address is not on there, so I will, um, list it in chat as well if you want to reach out to me directly. Um, and what else? That was all that we had to share tonight. We wanted to try and keep this um, pretty to the point. But um, again, please send me your contact information if you're remotely interested and then let me know how I can be of assistance to you. Thank you all for joining tonight and thank you again to AT and Newton for um, taking time away from their jobs to come back and share about their experiences as alumni. Thank, thank you. you, miss y'all. All right, thanks. Good to see everyone. Bye-bye.